Welcome. My name is Alistair. I'm the associate pastor here at Coastline. I'm grateful to be joining your small group today, wherever you may be. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever told God yes and yet lived by a no? Maybe it was in prayer. Lord, I'll trust you in this situation. But then you go through your day and worry sits in and you start to take things back into your own hands. Maybe it's in worship. Lord, I commit myself to you and your ways. And you feel it genuinely in the moment. But then Monday through Saturday, you start living for yourself again. Maybe it's in service. Lord, I'll go wherever you want. And then the Lord directs you, but you end up saying no. This tension is what we explored in the first sermon of our new series, Who is This King? We are looking at Israel saying, yes, we want you to be our God But no, we want a king like all the other nations. We looked at the life of Saul and how he said, yes, I will be appointed and anointed by you, Lord. But then he gave God a no and kept living for himself. And so this tension isn't new and it continues to impact us as Christians. We'll say, yes, Lord, I want you to be my savior. I want you to save me out of the conditions I'm in, but we can be reluctant to say, yes, Lord, be my Lord, direct my path and direct my way. So I want to do a deep dive into the gap between saying yes and living yes. And to explore this a bit deeper, I want to turn to a parable of Jesus in the gospel of Matthew chapter 21. Here's the parable. Jesus asks, what do you think? There is a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He said, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did his father, did what his father wanted? The first, the religious leaders answered. Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. Let's take a moment to pray. Father, we thank you for your word, and we ask that you'd apply it to our minds, that we not grow shallow, that you'd apply it to our hearts, that we not grow cold, and that you'd apply it to our feet. That we not just be doers of your, hearers of your word, but doers also. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Many years ago when I was living with my parents growing up, one of my chores was raking leaves. And I hated it. I hated it with a passion. I wanted to avoid it at all costs. I asked my dad, can we not just tear down these trees? I don't want to have to rake up leaves every season. Of course, the answer was a no. But I remember one year... On multiple occasions, my dad asked me, go, well, he didn't ask, he told me, go rake the leaves. And I say, yes. But then my actions were a no, I didn't do it. And this happened multiple times. And eventually my dad lured me outside and then he went inside and locked the door and said, you're not coming in until the leaves are raked. And I was furious and I refused. And then eventually I realized I'm going to have to do this. So I picked up the rake and it was pouring rain and I was raking the leaves and I was just bitter in my heart. You see, in this parable, Jesus, he's trying to get us to look at the motivations of our heart. You know, it's one thing to say, yes, I will do something. But it's another thing not to actually follow through. And Jesus says, it would be better for you to say no. If you're not going to do it, just say no. But his hope is that maybe you might repent and have a genuine yes. And in my case, Jesus isn't satisfied with us saying no, but then being forced into a yes. He doesn't want to force us into his ways. He wants a genuine yes. You know, he told this parable to a group of religious leaders who are very critical of his ministry. And they're saying no to Jesus again and again. And and in this parable, he's trying to get them to a genuine yes that comes by repentance. Repentance. But the question that we need to ask ourselves is, why does our heart resist having a wholehearted yes? Why is it easier to say yes than to live a yes? In the sermon this past Sunday, 
We looked at Saul and his calling as the first king of Israel. And there's this instance in 1 Samuel 13 in Gilgal, where Saul is instructed to meet Samuel the prophet. And he waits seven days, the appointed time by Samuel, and Samuel's late. And so Saul takes matters into his own hands and he offers the burnt sacrifice. And right after he does that, Samuel shows up and he says, Saul, You've done a foolish thing. Why have you done this? Why did you take matters into your own hands? And and Saul makes all these excuses and he actually lies and he, he justifies his actions. And what we see is Saul was driven by the pressure you know, the, the, the army around him, they were losing heart and starting to flee. He's driven by fear and anxiety. But we also th- see throughout his whole life, he was driven by self-reliance. He was determined to keep his independence. So he said yes to, to God, but he also said no in his actions. I can't wait. I'm going to take matters into my own hands. But then there's other ways we do this. You know, the religious leaders in the time of Jesus who heard this parable Jesus is trying to get them to move from a no to a yes, and yet they won't do it. They won't repent like the tax collectors and the prostitutes because they're accustomed to the status quo. They're accustomed to having a degree of self-control. They're they're accustomed to a way of living, and Jesus is disrupting it, and they can't say yes. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? You see, it's tempting to try to diagnose our hearts too much. You know, we can look at Saul and say, well, this is what was going on in his heart. We can look at me refusing to rake the leaves and analyze my heart. We can look at the religious leaders and analyze their hearts. And and we can see some themes. But Jeremiah, the prophet, says, look, the human heart on its own terms, it's actually sick and it's incurable by human means. And how do we even understand it? And the Apostle Paul articulates this in a profound way in Romans chapter 7, verse 16. You might be familiar with this. Here's what he says. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. Do you catch that? I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. This is... Our heart, it's sick at times, and it's hard to understand because we want to say yes to God, but then even as followers of Jesus, we can find ourselves saying no to his lordship in in our lives. And we might do that in many different areas. It might be in a relationship. It might be with your finances. It might be with your career. It might be how you spend your time. It might be your political convictions. But We're willing to say, Lord, I want you to be my savior, but... I only want you to be Lord over these areas. And when he wants to be Lord over our whole lives, we find ourselves in this gap between saying yes and living yes. And it's hard to understand our hearts. But what do we do? And this is where Romans 7 is so helpful. Paul goes on to say in chapter 7, verses 24 through 25, who will rescue me? Who will rescue me? You know, Paul's saying, you know, I I, I don't do the things I want to do and I do the things I don't want to do. Saul says yes to God, but then actually says no to doing what God wants in his life. The religious leaders just outright say no to God. You know, my dad had to force me to rake the leaves, but in my heart, I was bitter. I was giving a yes, but my heart was still a no. Who will rescue me? Asks Paul. Thanks be to God. Through Jesus Christ is what he says. And then Romans 8 comes next. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. You see, Jesus understands that our hearts are divided. Jesus understands that we can say yes with our lips, but live with a no in our hearts. Jesus understands that our hearts are incurable through our own efforts alone. And that is why he came. That is why he offered his life. That is why he fills us with his spirit, because left to our own devices, we cannot give God a wholehearted yes. And here's the beautiful truth. Before we ever said yes to God, Christ said yes 
to us. Before we ever said yes to God, Christ said yes to us. His yes was perfect. In the garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane, when he's struggling with the will of the Father, he says, not my will, but your will be done. He says yes on the cross, a complete yes to the plan of the Father so that he can utter the words, it is finished. He says yes, that covers all our partial yeses. And this is why Paul celebrates in 2 Corinthians that in Christ, every promise of God finds its yes and amen. And so when we're caught between saying yes to God and the no in our heart, the no in our living, we look to Christ and we see his perfect yes to the Father, his perfect yes to the ways of God, and his yes to us. And through him, we step into all the promises of God, including the promise to receive Christ's life-giving spirit so that our saying yes becomes a living yes through his power. You see, our transformation doesn't just come from trying harder. You know, our effort matters, but our effort can never overcome the gaps in our heart. Our transformation doesn't just come through, you know, confession either. I mean, it's important to admit that our hearts are broken, but our transformation comes by laying down our helplessness before God and saying, look, I want my yes to be more congruous. I want my yes to actually translate into how I live, but I recognize that I can't heal my heart through self-reflection. I can't heal my heart through my effort alone, but I can receive your yes. And that's where Jesus meets us. And that's where he starts to bring healing. And so there's some personal reflection you can do as a group. Where does your yes to God need to become more than words? Talk about that with each other and just be honest and hold a gracious space to say, look, I've said yes to God. I I love Jesus. I want to follow him. But there's some areas where in practice... In reality, I'm saying no. And talk about those areas. And maybe you offer some advice. Maybe you've been through those areas and you you can kind of encourage one another. But more so, proclaim Romans 8, 1 to one another. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. All that matters is saying yes to Christ again and again. And when we discover a no, We hold it before him. We say, Lord Jesus, help me. Help me want to want what you desire for my life. Help me lay down these things that I can't seem to let go of. You see, if we could handle our sin on our own, we wouldn't need a savior. And I think that's why it's easy for us to cry out for a savior. But then to cry out for a Lord means saying, look, Lord, I'm holding on to this and I want to want to let it go and I need your spirit to do the work. And so as you share honestly in a group, encourage one another with grace. It's grace that saves us and it's also grace that changes us. So let's pray. Father, we thank you that every promise you have ever made finds its yes and amen in Christ. And Jesus, we thank you that you said yes. You said yes to the Father's will. You said yes to the cross. And you've said yes to us. And we hold before you our hearts that are broken and fickle and frail, that often say no, even though we're trying to say yes. And we pray that by the power of your Spirit, you would continue to heal our hearts that we would have a genuine yes to living and walking in your ways, a yes that's not dependent on our own willpower alone, but is empowered by the grace and love of your spirit. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, groups, thank you for your time, and I hope you have a great conversation.